to make sure that those who um, are here, their times is, um, is cherished properly. So welcome everyone. Tonight we are learning a very, very interesting and very special uh, Torah portion. The Torah portion of tonight's discussion is Parshat Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha is a very special parsha, and for many reasons, obviously, as uh, my wife tells me that this is her favorite parsha, actually, Lech Lecha, because it has the story of uh, Avraham Avinu, our forefather Abraham, his travels to the land of Israel, the story of Sarah, and it's a story which goes through many um, interesting events, many wonderful experiences. And, uh, in one end, it's a story of challenge because Avram and Sarah are actually experiencing all kinds of difficulties in the story in this parsha. Starting with the first difficulty, I'm sorry, I'm going to close my phone. Um, just a second. Let me just close my phone. Thank you. The first difficulty that Avram and Sarah are experiencing is actually the, the beginning of the, and even the name of the parsha. The name is Lech Lecha. The parsha begins, Vayomer Hashem el Avram, Lech lecha me arzacha u mi mola de teha u mi beta vicha ela arez ashera reka. Lech lecha literally means I want you to go to leave your land, to leave your birthplace, to leave the home of your parents, to go to a land which I am going to show you where you should actually stop. Meaning is you're going to travel and there are going to be some locations along the way that you're going to say to yourself, hmm, sounds pretty interesting. What about that? Looks like an attractive area. What about Dubai? What about uh, uh, some other nice places along the, along the, along the ride? And God says, you're going to have to continue. And until the point will come that I am going to tell you, stop, this is where you belong. Avram was not a youngster. Avram was, as the Torah tells us in this parsha, Avraham ben shivim vechamesh shana betzeitoi mechoron. Avram was 75 years old when he left the home of his parents, the neighborhood that he grew up, the area which he was so familiar with for many, many years. In the age of 75, he has to pack his bags, put in whatever things he has in the chemidanas, into the suitcases, into the luggage, and take his wife, Sarah, and begin traveling. The good news and the bad news at the same time is that Avram did not have to schlep along a family with him. If you flew with kids, taking even a plane, know that this is not an easy task. Um, all ages, different challenges, but uh, never easy. Avram, in one end, had to travel, but no kids. He had no children at this time. So it was just him and his wife. But at the same time, it was a very tremendous challenge for them not to be blessed with a child to take along the journey. We are going to learn about Avram and Sarah having children only next week. This week, we're going to go through our old Pasha with all kinds of stories, but yet Avram and Sarah, as husband and wife, are still both childless, no kid on their own. So Avram at this time, lives his comfortable homeland, 
and he moves and travels just following the orders of Hashem. And he arrives in Israel and God says, this is the land that I am going to give to you and to your children which will come after you. And Avram is asked by God to walk through the land, Le'orka Ule'rochba, to its length and to its width. And this land that he sees and he travels through is going to become later the land of Israel and for the Jewish people, the descendants of Avram and Sarah. And Avram then is confronted with a number of challenges. Challenge number one was a big famine and hunger in the land of Israel. There was no food to purchase, nothing that he can sustain himself, which he understood from the way God blessed them before he left, that he has to go to a place where there is food. And he left Israel to Egypt. In Egypt is confronted with another challenge where his wife, Sarah, is getting kidnapped by the Egyptians. A tremendous difficulty for Avram. It ended up good in many ways, but at the time and the moment, it was a very, very big challenge. More challenges in this week's parsha is the story of his nephew, Lot, being captured in a very huge civil war, which is described in this week's parsha. It wasn't only a civil war, it was a war of different regions, different governments, different kings fighting the other group, five against four in the valley of Zdom. And Avram, who heard that his nephew was taken, he's putting himself in danger in order to ensure the well being of his nephew Lot. Another challenge which Avram goes through. And then finally, at the end of the Parsha, Avram is yet given another test, another challenge, which becomes the foundation of, 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 the, of his future people, the people of Israel. And this is when he's being commanded by God in the very late age, in his deep 90s, to go through a procedure called circumcision, brazania, a Brit. And it wasn't easy for Avram to have that Brit. No one wants to go to surgery at any time, how much more so when it's in an older age, you know, in the age of 90, it might even be um, even more, uh, even more difficult. You know, I remember um, <laughs> once we used to have um, in the previous years, not so much lately, there's no new immigration, but there were people immigrated from the former Soviet Union and they learned about the importance of making a bris. And even in the, in the shul, in the Torah center, on, on one of the tables were uh, elderly people, meaning elderly, meaning adults in age, Lying, uh, lying down and having a brief with a moil, with uh, the old procedure. And, and I remember one of them, a couple of days later, was making his way up the old Torah center. There was stairs to go from the parking lot to go upstairs to the synagogue. And I see him coming up and he wasn't walking, uh, he wasn't walking completely uh, straight. I said, are you feeling okay? He says, uh, yeah, I'm going to feel okay. I said, I see uh, you, you're walking. He says, look, most kids, when they have the breeze, it still takes them one year to walk after that. Because <laughs> usually they have it by eight days old. But anyway, it's supposed to be a drug. It takes them a year to walk. So he, 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 he took him a little, uh, a little less than that. But anyway, Avram is given the bris, and that's what this big pasha is going to come to an end. So as we can see that obviously this is a very fundamental pasha. Lech lecha. 
Lech Lecha means travel, go. And as a Jewish people, we also got the title, the traveling people. In Hebrew, they call it Hayehudi Hanoded. Hayehudi Hanoded is literally translated as the wandering Jew, but it's not really the wandering, it's more like the traveling one. Either because we traveled, because we couldn't, uh, we, could, we had no patience to stay in one place at a time, as they call it in Yiddish, sitting on spilkas, you're sitting on needles, and you're looking, you know, to always go elsewhere, looking to escape and trying a new experience in a new reality and hoping that maybe something else is going to work out even greater and nicer. And unfortunately, sometimes it wasn't that we wanted to travel, we were kind of forced in to travel and to move from the one place to another, Lech Lecha. Uh, the history of our people is a history which um, involves, and I'm sure even just in this Zoom class right here, we can see faces and representatives of people of many different areas in the world, all the way from North Africa to, uh, to the, the east of, um, of Russia, into Kazakhstan, into Morocco, into India, into uh, into America, into Ukraine. I mean, this is un German. I mean, it's unbelievable where and 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 how and what makes up the the colorful picture of of our of our people. But it's you. It has to do with traveling. It's usually people who travel, and this is all included in these two words that Hashem tells Avram lech lecha. I want you to go and to go without stopping. And from then we keep on going and going and going and all the way to the time of the Mashiach comes and we're gonna finally arrive to our final destination. But until then, we are always traveling. Lech Lecha. This is the story of our people, Lech Lecha. Um, there's a famous question. The question which is, is being presented by the great classic commentator of the Chumash, known in English as Nachmanides. Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, who lived also about 800 years ago, also originally from Spain. He actually also, Lech Lecha, he traveled his own ways. He came to Akko, eventually to Jerusalem, and back to Akko. And, uh, but he was a Talmudist and a great commentator on the Chumash. And he has tremendous insights, both from a practical point of view and also he shares sometimes mystical point of views too. When it comes to this Parsha, Nachmanides has a question which, it's a question that we should have all, all asked that question. Even if Ramban wouldn't have asked it, we, we, we could have, we are, we are allowed to ask this question and it, like I said, we should have asked this question. This question goes as follows. Imagine that the only reference of knowledge is the Chumash. That's what you know. You did not go to Hebrew school or to any other Jewish day school. Your grandparents, your parents did not share with you any background stories other than studying specifically the so-called Bible. So you read Parashat Bereshit, you moved on to Parashat Noach, and now you are holding the third parasha, Parashat Lech Lecha. The only thing that you know about Avram so far in the Bible is that in the end of last week's parasha, the Torah tells us that there was a man named Terach, and Terach had a son called Avram, and he had a song called Horon, and he had a song called Nocher, and that's it. And Terach died in a place called Horon. That was last week's Pasha. There was not a single story about that family. Like the end of Parshat Bereshit, which leads to the story of Noah, does end up with a verse that the world is corrupted, 
God regrets ever creating it. And Noah, the end of the Rishit says, Noach matza chen beine Hashem. That Noach found favor in the eyes of God. Comes Parshat Noach. You read about this man who previously found favor in the eyes of God. And you know that God is very not happy with, his, with, the, with the world that he is dealing with. Noach gets the orders to build an ark and the old discussion which we learned a little about it last week. But when it comes to this week's parsha, and the Torah begins, Vayomer Hashem el Avram, lech lecha mi artzcha. Leave your country, you go to the land Asher Areka, and I am going to make you dear into a great nation, and you're going to become a source of blessing, ve'ye bracha. And you wonder to yourself, who is that Avraham? What is that Avraham? Who is he? What is he? What do we know about him? We know that there's a man, 75 years old, and he gets orders from God to travel to the land of Israel. He's becoming the father of all nations. But what did he do till he was the age of 75? Why from all the people in the world did he deserve to receive that great mission of becoming the father of the nation of Israel, the father of monotheism, the father of Jewish philosophy, the father of the one who recognized and revealed God to the world. What is it that Noah, that Avram, who is he? What is it about him? So yes, if you ask any child who went to a Hebrew school or any Jew studied Midrash or studies any other books outside of the of the bible of the chumash is going to give you a whole list of amazing stories about avram that avram was a child who was searching for god he realized that the world cannot be run on its own there has to be someone who takes charge and is responsible and controls it and he was actually dealing with his father who was an idol worshiper and if he, the child is more advanced he's going to tell you stories about the father who owned a store of selling idols and Avram was the one who smashed some of those idols confronted his father about his beliefs challenged his father challenged the neighbor or challenged his family challenged the whole city about what is it that you're doing worshiping idols which have no meaning and have no sense and that made and absolutely means nothing. And if you learn even more, you're gonna learn that Avram was actually thrown into a furnace by a king called Nimrod. Nimrod, we know, was a very evil king and his name is mentioned as last week's parsha. but the Torah doesn't tell us about the story of Nimrod throwing in Avram in a furnace. The Medrash tells us now, don't take me wrong. I believe in every single story I just mentioned. If it's written in the Midrash, if it's a part of the so-called oral tradition, so this is a part of my belief system. I don't follow just the written Torah and assume that this is going to be enough for me to tell me how to live a life of Judaism, a life of meaning, because the written Torah is almost written in code. If I don't have the oral tradition to explain it and to, uh, and to elaborate on it, I would absolutely have no idea what God wants for me and what is his intention when he says anything that he says there. Nothing, has, nothing, is, nothing is in detail. So I believe in the Medrash and I believe in all the stories and I read the stories and I train my kids and teach them the stories. And in our Hebrew school, we learn the stories and this is the stories which are already with us for over 3,000 years since the story when it happened, since the time it happened, 3,800 years ago when Avram was alive. But Nachmanides asked a very, very classic question. He says, if Torah introduces Abraham as the one who is going to become the father of the nation, the one who is going to become the source of all those blessings, 
why is it that the Torah does not give us any background, any resume, any type of summary? Let us know who is that Abraham? Why are you trusting us just to study it in the Madrash? What is wrong with giving us a little bit of background? Let us at least know what he had accomplished. Especially if you think about it, all other great figures in the Torah do have some background starting from their very early age. Yitzchak went to the binding of Isaac. We all know this story. Jacob was dealing with a brother Esau. Moses was in the basket taken to Pharaoh, realizing that a Jew got hurt. He took the law into his hand and he made sure that everyone understands that you don't just beat up another Jew. And he had to escape to Midian and eventually became the leader. Everything has a story. Even King David has stories, running after the sheep, being a shepherd, caring, tenting for them. Anytime you hear about someone who made it into greatness, you go to his biography and you learn that there is something about his youth. There is something about his childhood, where he grew up, how he grew up, what kind of visions he had as a child, what kind of ideas, and it doesn't that suddenly Ocus Pocus is prime minister of Israel, right? He was involved in something. He was doing something. What is the story of Avram? Humanity says, I'm not asking you what is the story. We know the story. What I'm asking you is, why wouldn't the Torah share with us some of that story? This is his question. And, it, and the answer is the answer which we want to discuss tonight a little bit is really not just an answer on a question, but really the answer gives us a tremendous insight into who Avram was and what is our relationship with Avram. The interesting, before I'm going to go into an answer, let's consider another, another, another issue that, we, uh, that we're dealing with. Usually, a nation, a government, a, a philosophy, as which it's called, the, the founding fathers or the founding people who established, who developed the idea. This is called the great of the, the, great of the nations, the, the founders of the nation. In Hebrew, they call them Dor HaMeyazdim. You go back to the early development of the modern state of Israel, and you say the generation of the founders. I believe in every city in Israel, there is like a town square they call it Kikara Meyazdim, the square of the founders, or Rehova Meyazdim, the street of the finder, founders. They have cemeteries, which deal in special sections de designated Le Gdolei Auma, the great of the great of the nation, which is the great people which made the nation into a nation. And this exists all over the world. In, uh, in, in Russia, you can see uh, statues of all kinds of figures, even here in America, you know. What are they called in Hebrew? In Hebrew, the patriarchs and the matriarchs, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah, what are they referred to? Not as the founders. They are referred to as our fathers and mothers. Right? We start the Amida every morning, every afternoon, every evening. The first blessing of Amida is designated to the God of our forefathers. How do we start? Baruch Hashem. Blessed are you, God. 
Elokeinu velokei avoteinu, the God of our fathers. And we mention Abraham, Isaac, nature as what? As our fathers. In the Shema, we say every morning and every evening, Leman irbu yemeichem, v'yemei bneichem, al adama asher nishba Hashem, la'avoteichem. That you shall prolong your life and the lives of your children on the land and on the earth that God had sworn to whom? To your fathers, la'avoteichem, to your forefathers. The relationship is to us, children to parents. I believe that America would uh, adapted certain things from the Bible, also referring to the founders of our country as the founding fathers. And the reason is because I assume is because in the Bible, that's what the founders are referred to. They're referred to as fathers. So therefore, originally also, they were also called the founding fathers, Abateinu. And we are very proud to become and to be considered children of those parents. Now, you know how many years are between those fathers and us? This is going back to almost 4,000 years. Who refers to our 4,000 years ago great, 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 great grandfather as a father? Neither did we knew them, nor did our grandparents knew them, nor did our great grand grandparents knew them. This is almost 4,000 years. And what are we calling them? Fathers, mothers. They say a joke, not such a nice joke, but they say in Russia, so a part of the communist um, education was that your father becomes Stalin or Lenin, and your mother becomes Mama Rosha, becomes your mother. And you have to uh, express you, you, your loyalty of serving your parents, serving, uh, serving Russia. So at the morning school used to start when the teacher came into school and turned to each child, who is your father? The, the child used to respond, Lenin or Stalin. And who is your mother? Russia. And what do you want to be? I want to be a soldier in the Russian army. And like this, they used to go through child by child until the teacher realized there's one Jewish child who doesn't respond properly. So he went over to him very strictly and he says, hey, tell me clearly, who is your father? He says, Stalin. And who is your mother? Russia. And what do you want to be? An orphan. The idea is that not always are you proud of your father and mother. Sometimes you would rather be an orphan, God forbid. But for us, I'm Israel, we are very proud of it. Until today, we are called Aviseinu. And the question is, why is it that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are referred to as fathers and Sarah Rivka? Why don't we find the others being referred to as fathers? King David is not our father. The 12 tribes are not our fathers. And Moses even is not our father. Moses is referred to as Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses, our teacher, but not our father. Rachel is referred to as Rachel Imenu, our mother, Rachel, which by the way, tonight, traditionally the 11th day in the month of Cheshvan is the Yorzeit, the anniversary of passing of Rachel. Many people consider it the, the Samet Rashim, which uh, relate to that, that tonight that in the, and tomorrow is the Yorchat of Rachel. Usually in the, in the so-called, in, in the more normal days, people would have go visit the tomb of Rachel, which is right next to Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Hebron, where Yaakov buried here. Unfortunately, I believe that now due to COVID, um, I saw this morning that in the Israeli news, they said that no one should come and they're trying to lock it up. But, um, but it's a very popular place 
to come and, and pay a visit. I can tell you personally, when I go to Israel to visit my parents, probably almost every time I make a point to go visit the, the tomb of Rachel. It's not walking distance to my parents and I have to take a special bus. And it's not like in the city, but I always try to go visit the tomb of Rachel from all the holy places. And I can tell you, you walk in there and, and you can see it on the people there too. You feel like you came to visit your mother. You feel like in the presence of a mother, of a Bobby, of you know, of a, of a, of a very um, of a very warm atmosphere of not just visiting a sage or a holy place. You feel like you are being welcomed into somebody who really cares for you, and the type of prayer and, and emotion which takes place in the tomb of Rachel, and you can watch other people too. You can see that they are more, you know, you know, you're like opening up more in a close type of uh, expression, like you talk to your mom. And because Rachel was really our mom, matter of fact, the reason she is buried at that site is because she cared for the future generations when they're going to travel to Babylonia, they're going to walk by your graveside and shed a tear and ask for a prayer, ask for the return. She was the one who was given the, the, the promise of the Shavu Banim Legvulam, the children will return to their borders. That was all given to, um, to Rachel, the prophet Jeremiah. We actually read about it not too long ago on Rosh Hashanah. When he says, Kol berama nishma nei bechit amrurim, Rachel mevakal banea meana leinachem. There is the high, the outcry of Rachel who cries over her children and she doesn't want to get any comfort. She says, God, I'm not, I can't see it. This is my kid. And she finally only comes down when she's told and insured with the famous words, Veshavu banim ligvulam, that all children will return to their original borders. This was given to Mama Rochel, the Mama, the matriarch of, all our, of, 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 our, of our nation. Why are they called fathers? Why are they called mothers? So there is something which is being explained in different commentaries, but very in more detail, specifically, it's being explained also in Hasidus. And the Rebbe talks about it very interestingly. Basically, people which figure out an idea or even develop a certain philosophy or a belief system, they are very excited to share it with others. They're very excited to live a lifestyle based on those principles that they had so-called, that they believe in. But the one thing is to live a life that you think is important and you believe is important. And there's a whole other thing to make sure that that life gets also transmitted to the generation that comes after you or which follows you. In other words, let's take Avraham. Avraham, the one we're talking about. Avraham did discover God. He did discover God. He is considered the father of monetism. He was the one who had the revelation, the first realizing that there is a God in the world. Now, what did he do? Avram made sure that that which he had discovered and that which is important for him is being taught and spread and, 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 and further extended to every member of the human race. As the Torah tells us in a very short verse that Avram was traveling, Vayikra Shom Hashem Keil Oilam. 
Avram, wherever he went, he called in the name of God, calling him the God of the world, meaning there were people who believed in God. But Avram was the one who inspired people and he taught people the relationship that God has with the world. It's not a God of an abstract type of God who is somewhere in the lofty high world. God that you believe in is the God of who is your God. He cares about you. He's involved in your life. He's involved in your world. He's not somewhere abstract and transcends nature and, and, and the world. He's really involved in everything that you are a part of. This was Avram. And Avram did not keep the belief to himself. Once Abraham realized that, he went and he traveled and he, he figured out all kinds of way to make sure that that message gets, uh, gets delivered and becomes known to every single person who he came in contact with. That was Avram. That was the life of Avram. And that's why it carries the title Avraham Avinu, Avraham our father. Just like a father, what is the definition of a father? What is the definition of a mother? When do people become fathers and mothers? Is when they have children, when they have a generation which follows them. And this is what the story of Avraham and Sarah were that they made sure that whatever they believe and whatever they learn and whatever they appreciate becomes the life of their future children. It becomes a part of their life too. It continues. It's a legacy which means being continued to a next generation. It's not something that, you know, Noah. Noah was a great man and he was a tzaddik. But there was nothing that Noah did to make sure that his righteousness gets transmitted to his children. Better of fact, two of his children were altogether, uh, you know, nothing great to write home about. Chom and Yophis. Even Abba Chaim, in the Medrash, there is great stories Abba Chaim, but in the Chumash, we don't find anything Abba Chaim. And there was a man called Mesushelach, who was a tremendous person. That last week, the Torah tells us that God said, in seven days, I'm bringing the flood. Says Rashi, what is the seven days? Mesushelach passed away, and God says, I'm going to wait till after the Shiva, due to the special respect for such a tremendous person like Mesushelach, I'm going to wait seven days. And there was a man called Hanoch that we read last week. Remember Hanoch? Also a very righteous man. As she says, God invited them to heaven. He made them his like interior minister in charge of the prayers. All kinds of beautiful things. Tachlis, what's going on with their kids? Anybody knows? Nobody knows because nothing is going on. It doesn't somebody knows that something goes. You can Google them. And you're going to see there's nothing going on. There was nothing left of them. Nothing left of them. That wasn't their goal. That wasn't their purpose. The one person who made sure and he got involved that his message gets transmitted to the next generation and to the people around them, and it's not something that he's only being kept and cherished to himself, was Avraham. And Avraham told the same thing to Yitzchak. And Yitzchak told the same thing to Yaakov. And together with their wives, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, they made sure that whatever they are believing becomes a living example also for their children to follow. Which is, by the way, the best way of teaching. To serve as an example. There's so many great stories of people who became great people only because they saw the commitment and the belief of their parents to that which is important. They realize that this is what this is what's important for them. I read recently a story I will share with you.
I read recently a story, the story about, there was a, uh, actually a rabbi lived in Tzfat. The acronym of his name is Ritbaz. He came, he came from Lithuania. And he was a rabbi in Tzfat, you know, in Tzfat, it gets very cold in the winter. Today is the city a little more organized, but in not too long ago, especially if it snowed, it was very difficult to leave your house in the old city of Tzfat. It's not built in a way that you can just walk around and God forbid, it works on like, it, it, it's, like, it's, like an, it's like on a hill and it's on mountains. So it's very like, uh, you know, on, on top of each other. And it's uh, in cold, freezing days, it's difficult. This Radbaz had his father's yard site in the winter time. And he obviously wanted to make sure that there is a minion who comes together so he can say Kaddish for his father. And he used to get always very difficult, but it was like smack in the middle of the winter when people really were not really interested in coming out of their houses. And he always worked and managed to get a minion in honor of his father. One time he's sitting there at evening services and it's his father's yard site. And he's like giving like a sob, like, oh, like, you know, like krechzing about this, the loss of his father. And one of the congregants turns to him and he says, really, it's, it's interesting. Your father passed away 40 years ago. And you're already yourself in your mid-70s. And you're still like quetching as if you really, really miss your father. It's very unusual to see after 40 years of passing a person of a, a relatively, uh, you know, uh, older age, to still express as if he misses his father. What is it? So he told the sick congregant, it's good that you ask me, I will tell you a story about my father. And you're gonna understand why I miss my father. He says, my father lived in Lithuania in a small little shtetl. And in that shtetl, he was a man who built ovens. In those days, they used to build ovens into the house made of, um, made of stone, made of, uh, what do you call it, uh, bricks. And he hired a teacher to teach me. And he used to pay the teacher every week a certain amount of money. But it was the winter time and people were not looking to build ovens. And somehow there was no, no income. And if there's no income, there's no money to pay the teacher. And the teacher also needed to make a living. So after a couple months, I, I come one morning to school and the teacher tells me, um, I think it's our last day. I don't think I'm gonna be able to continue teaching you. And I came home and I told it to my father. And my father was very upset. And happened to be, went to the synagogue that day, really, really, discouraged what's going to happen with the studies of his son. And he hears two people are talking about their children who are getting married soon. And one tells the other, but what's going to happen? They're going to move into a house and it's cold in this winter. We got to see to build them an oven. So he says, oh, you're looking to build them an oven? I can build them an oven. Give me the opportunity and pay me what it costs to build an oven. He says, my father came home and he was the expert. So he was able to dismantle the existing oven of our house, took out stone by stone, brick by brick, brought it over to this house of these newlyweds and built them a new oven. And with the money he got, he paid the teacher, he should be able to continue teaching me for the rest of the winter. And we were freezing at home at that winter. But I learned and I saw how real important it is for my father, my learnings. And if I learned today, he said, and I'm a rabbi today here in Tzfat, it's only because of that what I saw more than 40 years ago when I was a little child in the little shtetl in Lithuania. So when I'm sitting here at my father's yard site and you wonder, do I miss my father? 
I miss my father because I look at myself, if I can read, if I'm a Jew, if I know what to do and what not to do, is because of his commitment and self-sacrifice that he showed me and gave me the ability to understand what is important and how important it is. And I'm sure that there is so many stories like that. But this is really the story of Avram. Avram was an example. Avram was an example. An example which the example continued as a legacy to the future generations to come. What was the main example of Avram? Going back to the question that we had before, who is all the stories about Avram? The answer is, my friends, the biggest story about Avram and the most important story about Avram is that Avram listened to God. All other stories that you know from the Medrash, which is amazing, ready to fight is, is you know, is, is, is natural family and challenge them and even being thrown into a furnace. It's amazing stories, but it does not come close to a story when a person is ready to listen to orders of God and say, this is what I am going to do because this is what he wants me to do and this is what I need to do. Lech lecha, me'artzecha, u'mimolatecha is the first time that somebody got orders in the Torah. That's the first order that Avram got. Lech lecha. He started walking. And I want to add to it a little bit. Lech lecha means to travel. To travel and still remain connected to the values that we believe is not always easy. We know, and we read the stories of people who came from Europe to America, very observant Jews, keeping traditional life. They came to America needing to adapt to the new golden country and become comfortable. Unfortunately, they were detaching themselves from the past and for sure weren't able, many of them, to transform, to transmit the same lifestyle to their future generations, to their children. They made it very well in America. They became citizens and they made money and they were able to be accepted in society. But unfortunately, the relationship and the connection to their past was basically gone for the next one or two or three generations. And same thing happened with people who came from other countries and moved. And whenever you get away from your, um, you know, a pre-existing place, especially a place that you were there for so long and you kept a certain lifestyle, it's very difficult to keep up while you travel. And I believe this is what Hashem tells Avram, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha, you should travel to where I tell you. Meaning, I don't just want you to follow my orders being in one place. I want to see you following my orders while you are traveling. You can't say, no, while I'm traveling, it's okay. You know, <laughs> I, once, <laughs> I once had a joke, someone said, that um, he was trying to offer a certain shidduch. You know what shidduch means? To offer a match for this young man. And he organized a date for this young man to meet this girl. No, he goes out, he meets with you, he speaks to you, and then he comes back and the shatran, the matchmaker says, how was? He says, look, she's, she was good, but what are you talking about? She's limping. She is limping. So the guy, the shatran, the matchmaker says, oh, come on, what are you worried? This is only when she walks, but when she doesn't walk, she's okay, right? <laughs> it's only when she walks. Lech yeah, When she walks, it's, uh, when, she, when she sits, she's like everybody else. 
It doesn't work like this, my friends. It does not work like this. Lech lecha means that while you walk, and specifically when we walk, when we have to make those difficult journeys, and journeys doesn't necessarily mean geographical moves from one place to another. Sometimes it's from one job to another job. Sometimes from one age to another age. Sometimes it's from one type of family status to another type of family status. Things are not always the same. This is all included in the term of traveling. This is all traveling. Traveling is a, is a, is a, is a, is a term. Tra traveling does not mean getting into a car or in the olden days into a horse. Traveling means that you are getting, you are changed from being conditioned in one place and now you're in another place. And this happens, it can happen every morning. You take a trip somewhere in your house while being quarantined in the state of COVID. Yesterday was not today and tomorrow may possibly not be today either. So what is what Avram is teaching us? Avram is teaching us Lech Lecha Asher Avram teaches us that we travel knowing and believing that this is all in the, in the so-called, in the orders of Hashem. And therefore you can remain focused regardless of the conditions and regardless of where you are traveling, you're always in the same situation because you're always in Hashem's hands. I always say the example that I heard from one of my teachers who left Russia. And when he left Russia, he traveled to many countries. First of all, he was originally from Russia, from St. Petersburg. From St. Petersburg, they had to escape to Samarkand during World War II. From Samarkand, they finally heard that there's a possibility to leave Russia to Lvov, 1948, with a Polish passport. So they went to Lvov, from there they came into Poland. From Poland, they arrived in Germany. They stayed in a DP camp in Germany for a number of years. From there they went to France. From France, they went to either to America or to Israel. This was all the people that I grew up with, okay? The typical Chabad guy is went through that lifestyle, okay? They traveled a lot. And he gave us the following observation. He says, when you ask someone, where, how did you come here? They will tell you. I started on the train in Tashkent, in Samarkand, and I drove to Moscow, from Moscow to Lvov, and from Lvov to, to, to Krakow, from Krakow to Berlin, and to München, and from München to, 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 to Paris. You have all kinds of countries. But when you have a little baby who is in his mother's hands, and if you're able to ask the baby, so who were you? Where did you travel? Who were you? One answer, I was in my mama's hands. Where? Which country? No idea. It's all the same. <laughs> you can go to 10 countries, 20 countries, 30 countries. You're all on the same, on the same, on the same arms of the very same mother who holds you, and you don't see any difference if it's here or there. This nationality, that nationality, this language, that language. It means absolutely nothing to you. Why? Because you are in the hands, in the arms of your mother. Comes Hashem and tells Avram, Lech lecha start traveling. But wherever you go, I am going with you. I am carrying with you. And Avram went, and wherever he went, he didn't just went on his own. He went and he shared that message that he was in, uh, discovering and he made sure that everybody is going along with the same idea. Everybody is, is, is understanding the same message. Because you also have to know, Avram in this week, in the after of the week, Avram is being referred to as Avram Ohavi. You know how Havi means? Avram, my lover. Each one of the, of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each one represents a different attribute 
a different direction in their connection with God. I mean, you can you can compare it to if you have like the, I just bought the, you know, to put in for the printer. What do you call it? That that, that coat of 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 ink. So there is red, yellow. Uh, you know, you have a, a couple colors there on that uh, on the on the on the surface, which presents the different colors that the that the ink can print, right? And this is cartridge. 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 Very good. So the cartridge has different colors. Same thing, there is the color of Avraham, and there's the color of Yitzchak, and there's the color of Yaakov. Yaakov, Avraham represented the relationship of love. That was his stamp, Avraham Ohavi. That's what he's called in this week's Aftora. He was love, love to Hashem. Yitzchak represented more the self-control, the reverence, the, the fear, the awe. And Jacob represented more the harmony, the truth. Each one represented a certain factor in how they relate to God. But Avram was a man of love. What does love mean? When you love, you are being present. You spread yourself out. You spread yourself out. You don't keep it to yourself. You want to make you 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 like you like you know you when you love your child, you go over them, you hug him. You grab him, you bring him with you. You right, you include him in your life. You don't separate yourself from him. You look to identify with others, to be a part of, of, of a greater world. And this was Avram. Avram was a man of Ava, a man of love. When he realized that important reality that there is a God in the world and God carries each and every one and he tells us what to do. And by us listening to what he does, what he tells us, we have the greatest opportunity to connect ourselves with him, right? That becomes for Avram the greatest story. I don't need to know that I was in a, in, in a furnace and I was doing this and was doing that. This is small money. This is really almost no story in regard to the greatest story that God himself was ready to tell me, do something for me. And I accepted to do something for him and then creating a connection with him. We and God became connected. He gives me orders. I follow the orders. Me becoming Nashbrat, right? Me becoming like, like, a, like, like, like a family. Look, he tells me what to do. I follow what to do. And he's involving me in his plan and with his purpose in creation. This is the greatest story. No other story compares to that story. Connecting to God by God wanting you. This is the greatest story. This is the story of Avram. So Mimele, to finish up, is what we discussed in this Pasha, is when we study the Pasha of Avram, is number one, is to remember that Avram for us is a father. Sarah for us uh, is a mother. Just like a biological father and mother, they keep us, they make us who we are. We look like them, we act like them. We, 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 we compare ourselves to them. This is our relationship to our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are like them. We are to become like them. We are like them. They gave us the opportunity to be like them. And in addition to that, it is also the importance to realize that the greatest value that Avram left us is the ability to travel in the orders and in the direction of Hashem. He traveled, we are travelers, we inherited as this is a part of our DNA. That's how it all started. Lech lecha. So if you get up next morning and you feel like you need to travel all through, I don't mean physically, you have to get into a car and go somewhere. But you feel like, you know, mentally, I think I got to move on somewhere. I got to try to experience something new. Don't get all to bubbled and say, oh, something is wrong with me. I can't settle and go pop in some pills to calm you down so you go back, God forbid, to where you have to be. It's okay. It's kosher 100% to consider opportunities. Every day should be a new opportunity. Don't listen to anyone who tells you differently. You tell him I'm a Jew 
and I'm a traveler, and this is who I am, and this is a part of my DNA, and let's, you know, let's try to make the best out of it. Make it a part of life. This is up this because this is it's gonna be. This is how it is. There's no way different. I'm sorry to tell you, there's no way different. The the the, the this is this is our DNA. It's our DNA, but in a good way, in a very good way, because it gives you the opportunity to grow. It gives you the opportunity to connect and to consider that tomorrow should be nicer than today. What's wrong with that? Why do I have to be stuck with today? I'm ready for tomorrow to be a nicer day than today. Lech lecha. So, as they say in Russian, payachole. Payachole means, uh, you know, gigangen, lalechet. And we have Rat Hashem, it Hashem self. We should all have, you know, a safe journey, travel peacefully, arrive peacefully, and, and God willing, see, like Avram saw in the end of all his travels, that it was all for his good. For the good of his family, for the good of his um, of his um, of his uh, of his of his purpose in life, and so too, we should all marry to be the same. So this is the story of Avram. Next week we will go into a few more details, which I would like to discuss, but um, there wasn't enough time today. I want to talk a little bit, Blinedo, next week. I want to know. I'm sure you all wondered what happened there with Avram with his wife. Uh, Avram with his wife Sarah and um, being taken, kidnapped what exactly happened there and Yitzchak's wife was kidnapped I, I want to share some, some insight that I learned, I'm still learning hopefully we can do it next week God willing should be a calm week next Wednesday we should all, can, we should all come together and, 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 and I'm sure it's going to be Rabbi, you are muted. Ah, Machaya. I felt what you're all feeling. If anybody wants to... Uh, you are muted. You? I'm good. If anybody wants to ask something, unmute yourself. If you want to say something, we will be happy to hear from you. Want to unmute yourself, anyone, you can do it.